<laughs> Got it. So, okay. yeah. So uh, I thought we could start uh, just kind of, I think the big thing that's preventing this from taking off, from juicing cannabis taking off is the legal side of things. Oh, yeah. And so I thought we could start with just sort of an update on that, uh, just kind of where things are with, you know, what efforts. I know back back 10 years ago, you know, you were working with the United Nations and trying to get their laws changed and all, and all that. So. And, and what's interesting is in, I don't know, 39 states, quite a few in the U.S., you know, their cannabis is uh, legal and you can um, use it in various forms. And so they allow you to inhale it and they allow edibles and edibles, but they kind of almost universally um, uh, do not allow you to use raw cannabis. And uh, I, where does that uh, distinction arise from? Because um, it's, uh, it's the safest way, the best way, the most diversely effective way. I mean, if you, um, I believe one thing that I would like everyone to do is spend some time looking at the endogenous cannabinoid system. Wikipedia is a good introduction, general Google search. There are you know, a lot of links to follow up. And the more you know about how the uh, cell regulates its function, the more you understand why cannabis is so diversely effective because it it supports the ECS and it doesn't not in any particular cell it supports it in all cells so a disease you know in the nervous system the muscular skeletal hormonal regulatory gonadal I mean um, wherever there may be a a disease it is capable of supporting efforts to restore normal function by supporting the, the ECS and so. The more you know about the endogenous cannabinoid system, the, the greater uh, understanding you have of uh, cannabis. I mean, and I'm always speaking of dietary, which is raw living. Um, some of the recent things that we got into as we got further away from Northern California was uh, an interest in um, cannabis sprouts and microgreens. And uh, there's one isolated study out of Eastern Europe that... Uh, suggests that uh, between day 10 and 14, um, that the microgreen presumably had uh, enough THC to produce a psychoactive effect, because this was, mm -hmm. I think it was a quote that kind of came out of marijuana chemistry in a, a, an old 70s book. And the whole, the whole book was about um, not wanting to interfere with THC's strength or potency. And it was very down on CBD because it, they felt it was going to a moderator, modulator, minimize the THC effect. I mean, so it's it's an older book with a with a, but but the the to me what comes with that is they have, they had done I think five or eight thousand GCMS analysis, and so they were pretty competent in that area. And so if they're if they're saying that um, there was a four day window, the window really had to be a psychoactive window, and that psychoactive window you know, roughly in general is about a 10,000 microgram dose of THC to to produce a, a psychoactive effect. Mm -hmm. So it, it kind of says that, you know, there to me, it, it brought the living plant into everyone's kitchen counter. Um, you know, if, if, you, if you can get a hold of some cannabis seed. And when I was in Northern California, 8,000 uh, patients who were all cultivators, they all had a five gallon bucket of, of seed that they had pulled off of a hermaphroditic conversion or, you know, they, they a, there was a ball of seeds in the, in a cannabis tree and they would they just toss these seeds in a bucket. So they all had a lot of cannabis. Um, they weren't maybe the purest genetic strain or most predictable. So they weren't really so excited about um, planting them. And, you know, they, because they, they didn't really know what the cross was and, where the pollen was associated, and um, but they did have a lot of did have a lot of seeds, and um, you know you toss a couple of tablespoons of uh, cannabis seeds into a quart jar, soak them overnight, and then particularly you want to um, rinse them regularly and drain them well because the only problems you have is uh, you know if you if you let them stand on water then they'll mold and you can lose the uh, sprout crop, but as long as you let them drain the uh, Cannabis sprout moves into the microgreen 
pretty much in that day 10 to 14 window. And, uh, and so you're able to produce living, vibrant, potent uh, cannabis um, on your kitchen counter, uh, whether you're a, an 83 year old octogenarian living up in a high rise of the 44th floor, or if you're at a garden in your backyard and live in the, in the you know, out of the country. So it really kind of equalized access to the uh, food grade, meaning, you know, you know, there's no herbicides, miticides, pesticides, you know, people that are getting their raw cannabis from a dispensary or cultivator, you never really know exactly what kind of exposures they may have been, uh, you know, you're dealing with. But when you're sprouting it from seed, the one the one kind of warning is if you end up in uh, some of the uh, commercial hemp, um, they'll put a fungicide on the seed to you know, to minimize its wilt. Um, and obviously, if, you know, if your seeds are coming out pink, um, I don't know if you can wash those off. It seems like you probably could, that you could you know, just scrub, wash them well, and that coating would, would come off. But in general, it's better to not have them coated in case there's you know, cracks in the shell or a place where that uh, fungicide could hide from a, a good scrub but the nice the nice thing is is that um you know it's moved back when i was in california uh, i had people that were living in trailers and would dedicate their second bathroom to um, a dietary cannabis grow and you know but as soon as you move into you know into uh plants that are growing then you then you soon will and you know pick up a spider mite and then you'll have an infestation and then you try to use sulfur or, or, or chemicals and, and it, it was just always a struggle to uh, deal with a, you know a 10 inch 12 inch 15 20 inch 24 inch but i remember going to these people's trailers or homes and they'd have a full a full vegetative grow meaning they had plants from cuttings that were you know on a rack on the sidewall and they'd have a four by four and then you know, maybe a one gallon and then maybe a three gallon at the back and they have these very tiered productions where they were just continuously making cuttings and then they would take the large plant um, and pull that out and you know juice that uh, or dice it up put in salad and when it comes to consumption you want to look at um, if you're if you're limited in your access to living plant then you definitely want to blend it because you can put the whole entire cannabis uh, you know, leaf or bud or sprout or microgreen into some hemp milk or whatever you prefer to, to, to blend it in and you're going to get um, total kind of total benefit if you if you take the cannabis plant and run it through a slow turning auger juicer the pulp coming out is very 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 potent the juice coming out also is extremely potent but there's a, a um, the the waste that comes off of it um, Really can be uh, recycled again, and uh, you can pull you can pull stuff out of that. You can blend it and juice it, um, but you want to be careful that um, if you're thinking that raw cannabis is not psychoactive, but you take that because uh, I actually I think I've mentioned this before, but uh, uh, we used to save all the uh, juicing pulp, and uh, a friend who was helping us prepare for a dinner, she thought it was. Uh, chopped spinach and so she took out a bag of chopped spinach and put it into a spinach souffle um, but in fact it was uh, raw cannabis and uh, uh, my father you know, had a two by two cutting of that and ate it and uh, did a face plant and I came in from outdoors and my father's you know he's not he's not stiff but he doesn't fall asleep at the dinner table <laughs> and, you know it, it was a bit of a surprise when the um, the, the, the raw cannabis was heated it, uh, it came out and because your dose can be very high when you're doing raw you can be taking an enormous amount of thc acid yeah. and if you take that uh, very large dose of thc acid and inadvertently uh, bake it for a while um, other things will get baked in the process yeah so yeah, yeah. The, the food, the dietary thing is just, it's just so wonderful, but you just have to be careful that you don't accidentally, uh, and I've had people that have uh, been able to, uh, you know, they've got a blend tech juicer, a Vitamix, they got some high end, high power, large motor blender, and you can make soups in those. Um, 
and it's one thing to make a, a blended cannabis drink, but if, if you're really trying to blend the fiber to a very smooth, you know, like you're, you're preparing something for someone who's a little reluctant or doesn't like a, a crunchy, a crunchy smoothie, you know, if you, if you over blend um, in one of those big machines, uh, you can actually uh, have a cannabis soup. And then once again, your non-psychoactive smoothie can become markedly psychoactive uh, inadvertently. Uh, you know, if, so if you're pre preparing this for someone, maybe to show them that it tastes good and it's useful and it's helpful, and the last thing you want to do is, uh, you know, put them into a semi-coma or put them on the couch for a couple hours. So you know, watch those blenders. Yeah, that's a that's a great tip. And I, I remember in I think the interview that I listened to uh, from Canvas Health Radio, you were talking about how the best option is really just to eat the leaves straight off the plant, like make a salad or something where you're not having to worry about trying to extract the juice or deal yeah. with a heating issue. You just eat the plant as it comes right off the plant. Live. And in particular, um, there's a lot of reasons that uh, what you want to go for, ideally, if particularly if you're, the amount of raw cannabis you have is somewhat restricted or limited, is if you do oral pharyngeal absorption, um, if you take the raw cannabis, uh, I, I would take the leaf and I would slice it along the long axis and turn it into like three inch long, eighth inch wide kind of sp spaghetti strands of raw cannabis, roll in a ball, put it between your jaw and your cheek. And the saliva softens it, and then pretty soon the terpenes are coming out and the cannabinoids. And every time you squeeze your cheek, there's a burst of those uh, very kind of tasty terpenes. Um, you know, it, it can be a bit overwhelming if you push too hard. So it, it becomes a bit of an art form by using a raw cannabis chew to keep it in the limits of, of comfort. Uh, but it's, what's interesting is the absorptions that occur in the oral cavity go directly into the venous system. And all that venous blood is collected and then kind of recycled and um, eventually is on its way to being sent to the lungs to be oxygenated. But before it gets there, um, there's um, some venous blood that is uh, shunted to the liver. And so, but only 10% of the venous blood is shunted to the liver for metabolism. So whatever cannabinoids you absorb from your mouth that are in that 10% shunt, those are likely to be uh, you know, combined with glucuronic acid or some other type of molecule to increase their solubility so they'll be eliminated in the urine. In the urine. Um, but if you look at, uh, if, you, if you swallow the raw cannabis immediately, you chew it up, chew it up and swallow it, and then it's absorbed from the intestine, 100% of uh, any, uh, any, any cannabinoids absorbed from the GI tract are shunted through the liver for metabolism. So if, you're, if you compare the oral absorption as opposed to the GI, um, you, you're gonna have a much, much, much higher serum level um, coming off of the uh, oral absorption than the GI absorption. So like I said, if you're, if you're in a situation where you don't have a lot on hand, then you definitely want to do, uh, you want to uh, make a chew out of it and you know, s slowly absorb it over a period of time because you'll, you'll have a much better serum level than if you uh, took that small amount and swallowed it and uh, absorb it through the intestines. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Are you aware of uh, people having adverse reactions to just eating the cannabis leaves or is it just, is it pretty rare? I have to very rare. I can only in uh, you know over 18,000 patient interviews, you know, with my patients when I was in active practice in Northern California, I had one or two people that said that they felt that there was a psychoactive effect from the raw cannabis. <clears throat> and and it, it, there's a possible alternative explanations are, you, know, you cut the raw cannabis, um, you know, at wherever you're growing it, and then you got a, a garbage bag or a black plastic bag, and you you've got some raw material in there, and you put it in the back seat of your car, and then you you know decide to stop at the grocery store and, and pick up a few things, 
and you you leave that cannabis uh, in a enclosed car, mm -hmm. you know, for smell and for loss. Um, but at that time, there's enough heat, um, depending on how long you're in the in the grocery store, that that heat can begin to um, decarboxylate the huge amounts of THC acid that are present. Mm -hmm. And so I think there's that those types of possibilities could account for why someone thought that there was a psychoactive effect from mm -hmm. their raw cannabis because of uh, inadvertent and un, just kind of un, you're unaware of the, the sources of heat that could uh, contribute to that conversion. And because like the, the vast, 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 vast majority of, you know, there is there is and, and no psychoactive effects from from the raw plant and possibly to get a lot of people, you know, they, they'll pull leaves off of, uh, they're, they're growing the plant for the bud primarily, um, but they're using the leaves on the side and, you know, they may, uh, you know, try to use some of the leaves that are real late in the season. And, uh, and there could be, uh, you know, some trichome oils and things that got onto, onto the leaf and, I mean, there, there are times in Northern California where the temperature was well over 100 and sometimes 115. And recently, I don't know what's going on out there now. I mean, temperatures are getting really hot, but that could uh, facilitate the uh, decarboxylation that would, uh, one might be confused as to why the uh, raw cannabis was having an effect. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, so in regard to the, you mentioned the microgreens, you know, this 10 to 14 days after germination, right? And you just got these small little baby plants that you can eat those or juice those. But uh, is, there a, is there an ideal time window in the development of the plant? No, I, I know I've seen some people have like 30 plants growing, they're planting every day and they're eating a plant every day on the back end. So it's, you know, I'm assuming that's about, 30 days worth of growth, but is there a better time to, to eat the plant in terms of the, the potency of the CBD? It, um, or the potency of all the cannabinoids. I mean, yeah. we kind of focused on uh, CBD or THC, but CBD acid has a carboxyl acid group on it, which is a very polar, very charged. Um, and that is going to dramatically dif differ in terms of the docking receptacles between CBD and CBDA. Mm. So the medicinal acidics, um, a lot of people just say, well, you know, what's the difference between CBD and CBD acid? You know, they're all the same molecule. They, you couldn't get more distinct molecules because one of them has a highly charged polar moiety attached and the other one does not. And so mm. one's going to be very neutral and lipophilic and the other one's going to be moving towards aqueous uh, receptors or, you know, still places where that polarity would, would be significant in terms of uh, the receptors to which they can become attached and have a, have an effect. Yeah. So, does it depend on the strain or the plant in terms of when when's the best time to eat it? The, um, so you got this. You have that one one little window in the middle, and I am waiting for someone to fund the research so that we can reproduce that study. I mean, it's like essentially. Um, day seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and just to confirm its its presence and its disappearance. So that would help time. And it's interesting that I believe, or at least I speculate that the, uh, the, the study was with um, seeds that were put in the ground because it's you know, back in the seventies and then maybe less likely to be doing other things. And so um, they may have started, they may have called day one when that dicotyledon first breaks through the surface of the soil. Hmm. And so if you're doing germination, a lot of people say, well, I see a root, so it's germinated. I'm going to start counting at that point. Um, I'd rather I'd rather wait and begin, call day one when you see that first die cut in your sprouting jar, which is going to be you know, another you know, seven, 10 days later than the appearance of the root. So that yeah. that is a, is a bit of a uh, significant point, meaning that you're, um, and then there, in addition, uh, classically, classically, you'll find a lot of literature saying that you know, there's very little phytocannabinoid production in the first month of the plant's life. 
that's in contradistinction to the possibility that there is a uh, very short four-day window in the middle of that first month, but that could be overlooked. But actually, the, the phytocannabinoids uh, um, really begin to build and accumulate in the second month, and they just keep building until the end of the third. So absolute peak vegetative strength is going to be between day 80 and 90 at the end of the third month. So it just builds and builds. And so the, the, the bioavailability or the, at least the, the amount that's present in the plant material will continue to. And then another study that I'm eager to uh, see the answer to is if you push that plant out, um, and so now you're at day 80 and 90, but you're giving that vegetative plant, you know, uh, um, and this is for a phototropic strain, if you're giving that plant enough light that it uh, thinks it's still in spring, early summer, um, they'll, I, I believe, I've heard that there are, you know, manufacturing or cultivation places where they've had uh, vegetative plants in vegetative phase for years. Uh, they they will stay vegetative, um, and the assumption would be that they would be peak production during that entire time. So if you can, if you're into supplemental light, I got the power and um, to to be able to do that, you can keep uh, uh, you know well, very large cannabis trees in the vegetative phase, and and that make that's a, a convenience, meaning you can go out there and pull off as many leaves as you want and time you want. If you got, you know, five or six, six foot tall trees, you know, uh, de-leafing is not going to be uh, as much of a problem as if you're consuming a, a 12 inch tall plant, you eat the whole thing. I mean, it's, uh, but if you don't have that supplemental lighting, then they'll trip into flower and, and be in its uh, fluorescent phase. Yeah. So then it sounds to me like, uh, having a, you know 30 plants where you're eating one plant that would be presumably like a 12 inch plant after 30 days or something uh, and then you're starting a new plant each day this is necessarily the best approach I'm thinking in terms of somebody you know in a, in a small home or a apartment or somewhere where they don't have a, a garden that they can just have you know a lot of space to grow uh, but someone that wants to use it in a, in a preventative capacity versus treating something up you know like a, a chronic condition, uh, just where they want to eat the right amount of cannabis each day to, to supplement their diet, the way that you've described in previous videos. Yeah, I mean, one of my favorite phrases is, you only need cannabis as medicine when you forgot it as food. And so, <laughs> I love that. Yeah, I mean, if, you're, if you've got raw cannabis in your diet, then prevention is the order of the day. And, and that's where, if, if the sprouts prove uh, reproducible, if, if in fact, we can identify that four day window relative to when we first soak them or when we first see the root or when we first see the dicotyledon form, you know, we, we can nail down and say, okay, this is day one begins now. And then uh, 10 days after that, you want to consume them. It's pretty e easy to, you know, eat a, um, if you got a quart jar, you know, you can do a, a pint of greens a day pretty simply. I mean, They'll blend into anything. Uh, you put them in salads, put them on sandwiches. They they can have some sharp flavor. Um, you know, uh, one of the really favorite dishes in uh, around here is you know, you, you mix it um, and make a uh, um, with uh, basil. We we actually have a a tree that produces basil down here. I mean, it's bizarre. I mean, always basil was a small leafy green kind of yeah. annual vegetable, but out here there's there's these trees annuals have these leaves that are just uh, very incredibly basal tasting hmm. um, so the nice thing about um i hadn't really thought about it I, I need to figure out if we can get these trees growing in other places i mean it's it's such a godsend in, in terms of not having to always be struggle i mean it, it was challenging for me to to grow and to keep the basil growing enough and particularly on a year-round basis in a temperate climate hmm. um, but if these trees, if these trees were viable other places, it just is such a wonderful way because just it just neutralizes the uh, cannabis flavor and mm. turns it into this pesto that is absolutely delicious. <laughs> um, the same, but the caveat once again is if you put it, you put it on your pasta the night before, you know, you don't want to warm it 
the next day for lunch uh, because that huge amount of uh, pesto uh, really can sneak up on you if you uh, bake it and you know, put it 320 or something for 10, 15 minutes until the, the things warm all the way through. Yeah. It could be a, could be a real rude awakening when you, <laughs> uh, yeah. 20, 30 minutes after you had lunch. I'd be very respectful of the plant. Yes, yes, and be just that you get respectful of heat. Yeah. I mean, um, the no other animal can decarboxylate in the way humans can, and other animals are just going to eat this thing raw. I mean, I remember running across a friend's backyard with uh, a couple of one gallon pots and some two to three foot tall plants. I was trying to get in the kitchen, you know, and there were some goats loose in the backyard, and they were just going to chow down. And eat as much of this plant as they could, you know, and run it faster, and they're running faster than me, and they're chomping away. You know, there's there is no psychoactivity pretty much in the animal kingdom. I mean, theoretically, yeah, you can make a, a baked good, and your your dog may decide to eat a brownie or a cookie, or you know, you, you can uh, domesticate them in that direction. But the rest of the animal kingdom, you know, it's really not an issue at all. Um, and if we if we would mimic and follow how other animals use this plant, um, we would be led in the right direction to optimize prevention. And the, the, the prevention thing is huge. And you, you really want to know exactly why cannabis is so successful at preventing disease. And it comes back to that studying uh, the system inside of the cells of our body, the endogenous cannabinoid. And the inter you know, so if you look at the whole regulatory, you got the uh, endocrine system regulates the entire body. Um, paracrine will regulate, a, you know, say, 100 cells producing thyroxin, and they're trying to produce enough uh, thyroxin so that the body's metabolism is uh, appropriate. They don't want it. They don't want extra. They don't want. They don't want to be a deficiency. There's a bandwidth of kind of hormonal simulation. Um, Autocrine is a regulation across that plasma membrane from inside the cell to outside. But that intracrine, the intracellular regulation is really the domain of cannabis. And so you, you, know, you, 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 you want to facilitate that intracellular uh, uh, homeostasis that there's everything's in place. It's already, you know, we've got 2-AG and palmatial ether. You, you've got a bunch of endogenous cannabinoids that are doing their thing. And you just want to support that system and you know, not necessarily delicately because the, the body is is quite capable of uh, uh, sequestration is the process whereby the body quickly removes from the from the bloodstream these uh, ter terpenes and, and cannabinoids and, and pulls them out and puts them into uh, uh, lipid cells um, or fatty structures, so they're, they're fat soluble, so they, they are quickly moved into storage. And then very slowly, they're removed from these kind of fatty depots and reintroduced into the, into the bloodstream where they're judiciously uh, available. And um, an important study, um, I've got a, a patent application that I've been working on, on, on sequestration and summation and it kind of looks at, um, the, there's three or four major um, uh, articles out there about the, uh, the time to elimination. And it's quite divergent. I mean, uh, federal government wants it to be 30 days, but everyone knows that that's a spin. Um, but somewhere between 60 and 90 to 240 days is how long the body will be able to continually supply exogenous phytocannabinoids to the serum to support cell health and cell function. And so, you know, it's it's very, very well reserved. Um, and uh, the body is, you know, the body is tenacious in grabbing the molecules, storing them, and they're gingerly in using them. So it, it tries to buffer its own. I mean, because if you look at how other animals, I mean, you know, is it every day that you run into a, a canvas plant in the wild, you know, and, and so the <clears throat> the body wants to be very judicious in its consumption and uh, preservation to support uh, cell regulation, cell health, and the prevention of disease. And then if, if you've got a problem, then it's therapeutic uh, uh, kind of 
treatment of a, of a condition that you, you know, you're a deer, you stumbled and you, know, you broke a, a hip or damaged a joint and you got inflammation, you know, they're, they're, they, that anti-inflammatory effect for which cannabis is independently patented and is really a, is a, is a big one. And I think it's pretty much without compare in terms of that ability to control the, uh, or downplay the inflammatory overreaction that causes so many problems, either with the immune system, the autoimmune system, or, you know, juvenile rheumatoid, adult rheumatoid. I mean, all those conditions really are the body kind of turning against itself inadvertently. I think it's, um, I think, you know, some Latin or Greek person, autotoxis horrible is, 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 is what they uh, call the immune system that has turned on itself. And so when you can come in and kind of quell that uh, horriblest reaction, um, you will be very grateful. I mean, there are um, pharmaceuticals, you know, but those end up whacking your liver and then you get liver studies and then you got to stop it and then you're looking for something else and scrambling around to mimic um, the beauty of this plant to uh, you know, kind of modulate and downregulate overreactive um, autoimmune conditions, inflammatory conditions. Yeah. yeah, that was going to be one of my other, just the, the things that occurred to me is um, why is it that these conditions, if you're treating a, an acute condition, why is it that the condition returns, you know, when the cannabis is, is removed? It's, it's like, this isn't a cure for anything. This is a, this is something that can effectively put the body back into balance, it sounds like. Because we're well, out, so far a, out of balance, it's a cure in the sense that if you look at other nutritional elements, you know, vitamin C. If you if you're on a boat sailing across the Atlantic and there's no citrix, there's no vitamin C available, you can end up with scurvy, and scurvy can be a real serious condition. Yeah, and then so if you look at vitamin A, if you look at all the vitamins, you know, they, they have some function that they support, and a deficiency syndrome occurs for almost all of them. Well, um, vitamin W, uh, you know, and if you look at the Urban Legend Dictionary, vitamin W is, you know, they jokingly will call that weed and, you know, uh, you should smoke every day or whatever. Well, I've, I've been trying to overwrite um, some of the humorous uh, definitions in that list and look at the, the terpenocannabinoids are a couple and the flavonoids are also in there, the canaflavins, but th their inclusion, inclusion in the uh, and, and as a vitamin, it's like, yeah, if you want to be deficient, you're going to have deficiency syndromes. You want to be deficient in vitamin D? Yeah, you're going to have you know, rickets. You want to be deficient in C? Yeah, you're going to have scurvy. You can buy a 10? Yeah, you're going to have you know, a, a, a deficiency syndrome. If you were deficient in cannabinoids, you were going to have a deficiency syndrome or a lot of them. Yeah. And, you know, so please... It's it's not it's not uh, you know it's not convenient you know it's so hard you know my landlord doesn't like it you know your life is worth living where you can care for yourself and I've had so many discussions with people whose landlords were just you know oh, my VA loans gonna be threatened I'm gonna be I'm gonna lose my lose my job lose my mortgage and you know that's their problem not yours and if you're their tenant and they're leaning on you to you know take it someplace else and then pretty soon it's hard to do and you start you know skipping out or missing it and you know, your, your life is worth living where you can care for yourself in a critical way and this is not just you know it's like you just think of, of the other vitamins out there and uh, you know you 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 don't really want to mess with scurvy or, or rickets or these other uh, type of deficiencies, and you do not want to mess with deficiencies in the phytocannabinoid, terpenoid space because um, those independently are very effective. But what's most interesting is the synergies that arise between these different classes of molecules in this plant. I mean, you know, there you can get just terpene supplements, and there's a lot of literature on terpenes, and you know, there's ten thousand articles on CBD and but there's you know THCV and there's uh, you, know, you know a variant you know a three carbon tail rather than a five carbon tail and why is that you know why is that so different than you know, uh, the, you know the straight up THCV and um, 
there's just so much going on the plant. I mean, they just came out, there was a THCP, there's another phytocannabinoid this year that was discovered that it's been there. It's probably been there 10, 20,000 years, you know, we just found out. And so it doesn't really make, we don't really uh, consider it until we know it's there. And they're, oh, what's the, how much of that do you need, you know, and where do you get that? Mm -hmm. Just, you know, be humble eat the plant the way other animals do, just eat the living plant and all of its surprises known and unknown are yours. And, um, you know, you can be proud of what you know about the plant and that can guide you in uh, spending the time and energy to be sure that you don't become deficient. So, you know, it's, you know, I, I can't wait till you go to the grocery store and pick yourself up a four by four or a bag of microgreens, you know, a couple of bucks and get yourself a pound and you're good for a week and I mean that why can you get mung beans and not cannabis sprouts you know why can you get a four by four of wheatgrass but not a cannabis you know it's only because it would turn the healthcare industry upside down on its head if uh, it was if it was used and available in the diet um, and they would be looking for you know, you know what, what kind of a job they're going to take up next because uh the prevention. I mean, there's a lot of people, trillions of dollars are made on the treatment of disease. Uh, you don't make trillions of dollars when you prevent disease. 